There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. For the next hour, you must suspend your disbelief. Suppose an alien spacecraft has crashed in the desert. We recovered it. Our job? Figure out how it works. Reverse engineer the technology. With the help of leading physicists, astronomers, and engineers, we'll decipher UFO technology. Inertia cancelers, anti-gravity devices, and wormhole excavators. And maybe in the process, discover the secrets of the universe through alien engineering. What you are about to participate in is an exercise in imagination. Prepare yourself. This is an alien spaceship that crashed in the desert some years ago. We've been given the task of decoding the technology and figuring out how it runs. We've assembled a team of some of the smartest and most imaginative researchers, physicists, engineers, and astronomers as advisors. Step by step, our experts will take us on a technical tour of this ship, from its controls, to its aerodynamics, to its propulsion. We'll learn how it travels through space, and how it maneuvers in the air. This task won't be easy, but it will be rewarding. Alien technology is centuries, millennia ahead of ours. When speaking about flying saucers and UFOs, people are gonna laugh behind your back, and there goes your career. My attitude is, we have to have an open mind. Open your mind to the possibility that a civilization could exist that is a million years ahead of us. I say, find me a law of physics that prevents contact between civilizations that are a million years ahead of us. No need to convince us, we have the proof. This ship is like a cheat sheet for advanced physics. Let's start with the basics, the shape and flight characteristics of the ship. Our aliens built a saucer. Are there any aerodynamic advantages to this shape? There were plenty of other options. Examining records of UFO sightings over the last 50 years, it's obvious there's more than one design. When you start researching UFO sightings, you quickly realize that there's uh, many commonalities throughout the cases that, that uh, kind of stay true throughout all the, all the different reports. The number one thing is we think of UFO, we think of a flying saucer. The disc shape, usually metallic, glistens in the sunlight. And that's really probably the most prevalent. Secondly, you have the cigar-shaped UFOs. Then one of the other popular types of sightings are the lights in the sky the glowing orbs, sometimes going very slow, sometimes seen going very fast. A triangle or boomerang is another commonly reported shape. Since aliens may come from all over the galaxy, it makes sense that they would have different makes and models, just like we do with our aircraft. Each has its own purpose and handling characteristics. When you think of a light plane, the wings, generally have blunt leading edges, but the minute you get into higher speeds, then the wings have to have sharp leading edges. When you get into hypersonic speeds, there may be no wings at all. The hypersonic vehicle that uh, NASA is testing now essentially is a, is a flying slab. Shape does affect the aerodynamics of objects flying in our atmosphere. When you think about a conventional airplane, there are generally the, the forces that, that act on it are lift. And that's generally done by some surface, we call it a wing. Now acting against lift is drag. That is the, the, the mere fact of the air moving over a surface 
and tends to impede it. That, of course, has to be overcome by some kind of forward propulsion or thrust that counteracts drag. Few of the reported sightings mention wings, tails, jets, or propellers. But an object lacking these essentials could still stay aloft. You know, there's a saying, with enough propulsion, you can fly a brick, and, and that's true. With enough propulsion, a craft can even make it into space. Like our rockets, the cigar-shaped UFOs would be good for drilling through our thick atmosphere. When looking at reported UFO shapes, the boomerang or triangle is one of the best, aerodynamically speaking. We even have our own boomerang-shaped aircraft, such as the B-2 stealth bomber. It's known as a flying wing design. The flying wing is a beautiful shape, at least for subsonic flight, because it's all wing and it's all efficient. The minute you start putting engines hanging out, the minute you put a fuselage, the minute you put a tail, a rudder, and elevators, you're adding drag. Flying wing doesn't have that. The boomerang-shaped flying wing dates back to the early half of the 20th century. Northrop Aircraft Company even developed a long-range bomber using this shape during World War II. Coincidentally, the sighting that started the UFO phenomenon also describes boomerang-shaped objects. On June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold, a recreational pilot, was flying in his single-engine Cessna in the Cascade Mountain Range of Washington State when a flash caught his attention. He claimed to see several metallic objects flying in a loose V formation and moving at a terrific speed, in his words. Interviewed by both the news media and the FBI, Arnold ushered in the modern era of the unidentified flying object when he described his object flying like saucers skipping across the water. However, he didn't say they looked like saucers. Arnold later made some sort of a sketch for someone to describe the shape, and it turned out it wasn't exactly a saucer, but the term is stuck. Comparing Arnold's sketch with a stealth aircraft from the US Air Force reveals some similarities. Maybe those aliens who build triangular spaceships are also concerned about drag when flying in our Earth's atmosphere. Of course, in the vacuum of space, drag is not an issue. Looking at other commonly reported shapes of UFOs, we realize our aliens don't seem to care about drag in our atmosphere at all. If they did, they wouldn't build flying saucers. Saucers just aren't that stable or easy to control, at least for us humans. It doesn't have any particular control surfaces like the fins or the flaps on a conventional airplane for changing direction, either climbing or turning. So it's really hard to see why this would be a particularly advantageous shape for flying inside any kind of atmosphere. People have dabbled making flying saucers, and in fact, they've shown that it can be done. Generally, they're saucer shaped, they have a big fan in the center, and they take off and they fly, and it's a good show. But it's a lousy airplane. It's a very inefficient lifting surface. And they're getting most of their lift from the fan that is blowing air down, more like a helicopter. If you were grading for efficiency, it would be at the bottom of the scale as far as a lifting device is concerned. So why would the aliens build such aerodynamically inefficient craft? The truth is, they could build any shape of ship and it would still fly, thanks to its super strong propulsion system. And it seems to me that when you think about what's been reported, 
Their propulsion systems must be so powerful that it really doesn't matter what shape they are. We'll explore our alien ship's propulsion later. But for now, let's keep this in mind. On this ship, aerodynamics are almost obsolete. Maybe our aliens selected the flying saucer model for no other reason than it looks cool. If their propulsion system is as strong as we think, how do the aliens on board survive the forces of abrupt changes in speed? Violent forces that would rip a human being apart. In other words, somewhere on this ship, there's an inertia canceller. We'll send in our team to find it. Our alien ship is immune to the effects of drag within Earth's atmosphere. But even more significantly, it's immune to the effects of inertia. The universal property of matter that causes a body at rest to stay at rest and a body in motion to stay in motion. Our alien spaceship has an inertia canceller, a sort of high-tech seat belt that keeps everything inside our fast-moving ship from going through the windshield. By examining UFO reports, our experts can better comprehend this piece of alien equipment. Sometimes you hear reports of this UFO or craft or ship or however they want to describe it moving hundreds if not thousands of miles an hour streaking across the sky, sometimes doing a right angle move or going up and down, and something we obviously have not achieved yet as a human race. We offer the following straight from the UFO files of the United States Air Force for your edification. December 6, 1952, in the last minutes before dawn, a B-29 bomber conducts a training mission over the Gulf of Mexico. Suddenly, an object appears on radar, heading straight toward the bomber. Captain, bogey inbound, moving at 3,800. No, 4,200 4, knots, sir, over. That's nearly 5,000 miles per hour. She's coming in, 3 o'clock, sir, over. A crewman jumps to the right blister window to see a blue-white light streak by. Then four more blips appear on the scope. We got another one, sir, coming in. Sir, at this range, you should have visual. Over. They, too, scream by at more than 5,000 miles per hour. What was that? Then one of the objects breaks away and starts following the plane. Minutes later, the radar operator sees all the blips fly toward and merge with a much larger radar blip that suggests a large flying craft. This large mothership then tears off at more than 9,000 miles per hour. Our aircraft then and now can't come close to that speed. And even if they could, it would kill us to be going that fast and suddenly stop or turn. The acceleration forces generated by performing such maneuvers would rip an aircraft structure and its occupants apart. Any time that you slow down, speed up, or turn, a force is involved. And if it's very severe, then the force has to be very severe. That's because of inertia. Once again, the property of matter that causes a body at rest to stay at rest and a body in motion to stay in motion at the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an outside force. 
That's why when you're in a car and you slow down that you're lurching forward because your body wants to keep moving forward even though the car is not. If the spaceship is traveling 5,000 miles per hour and abruptly stops, the craft might come to a halt. But the alien pilots continue moving forward due to inertia. In other words... If they're built anything like us, they become wet smears on the inside surface of the spacecraft. That's why the inertia canceller is a must. To understand how this might work, we can look at the research garnered by over 100 years of flight testing right here on Earth. Acceleration forces are measured in units of gravitational acceleration, or g-forces. A single G is the pull downward Earth has on our bodies when we're at sea level. Jet fighter and stunt pilots pull elevated Gs up to nine during certain maneuvers. Pulling back on the stick generates positive Gs. This gives a person the sensation of being several times heavier. Diving, or abruptly stopping, produces negative Gs and a feeling of weightlessness, like a roller coaster going down the first large drop. But pulling serious Gs isn't like riding an amusement park attraction. In fact, it can be deadly. Here at Lemoore, California's Naval Air Station, Pilots take a ride in the human centrifuge to see just how many positive Gs the human body can withstand. Okay, go ahead. Should start to build the gradual onset of Gs now. The centrifuge we have here, the gondola itself travels at about 65 or 70 miles an hour, which doesn't seem like it's all that fast, but as it rotates on that arm, it produces some very significant G-forces, as much as 15 Gs, although we are human limited to nine Gs. The goal of our training here is to educate pilots and air crew what it feels like to pull Gs under controlled laboratory uh, situation. We will often take them right to the edge of G-lock. G-lock is the technical term for gravity-induced loss of consciousness caused by blood draining from the brain. Testing helps pilots to know what the onset of G-lock feels like and therefore how to avoid it later when they're actually flying. Unchecked, G-lock can cause pilots to black out. Eventually, they will die, either from lack of oxygen or from crashing their aircraft. What happens is, at certain points, the blood literally cannot pump around your whole body. The forces are so great that the blood gets pushed to your legs. So 10 Gs, a very hardy astronaut could survive. Beyond that, literally parts of your body get pushed apart, get crushed literally by the G-forces. The human body is even more sensitive to pulling negative Gs. We know much about the way negative Gs affect the human body because of the work of men like Dr. John Stapp. Stapp worked for the Air Force as his own guinea pig, climbing into rocket sleds and shooting himself down a long track, only to be instantly stopped. This generated tremendous negative Gs. On one run in 1954, Staff reached a speed of 632 miles an hour before slamming to a stop in less than two seconds. He survived, but suffered a complete red out, bursting the capillaries in his eyes due to the force of more than 40 Gs. Stapp's experiments made everything from ejection seats to car safety belts safer. However dramatic, 
These tests don't come close to producing the kind of G's a ride in a UFO would. Let's say a flying saucer were traveling at the speed of sound and made a right angle turn in a tenth of a second, the acceleration felt would be about 300 G's, which would really be enough probably to tear everything apart, any material we know of and everything inside it. But that maneuver is nothing for a UFO. Some radar reports indicate an object going from rest to 9,000 miles per hour almost instantaneously. The g-forces that you'd experience if you did that would be literally thousands of times the force of gravity. And that would be far greater than you'd experience, say, if you were in a jet plane that lost power and crashed on the ground. Our ship has an inertia canceler because simply flooring the ship's gas pedal creates more g-forces than crashing a plane. So how does it work? There'd have to be something within the craft that would counter these g-forces. One possible way, at least in principle, is to actually manipulate the force of gravity itself. For example, if I could produce a gravitational field in front of me within the spacecraft that was pulling me forward at the same force that I was being pushed back into the seat. A gravitational force field. This must be exactly how the alien inertia canceller works. You would presumably have to be able to turn it on and off in some easily controlled way and very quickly because if you're going to make a very quick change in your state of motion, you have to be able to deal with it quickly. These aliens have shown us humans the way to overcome inertia. Maybe someday we'll use this knowledge to eliminate the need for, among other things, safety belts and airbags. Now that we've figured out what the inertia canceller does, our next goal is deciphering the propulsion system. Our experts believe it's either a force field generator or an anti-gravity drive. Our scientists are reverse engineering one right now. Beyond their shock value, Close encounters with UFOs can reveal secrets about how alien spacecraft actually function. Perhaps even clues about their propulsion systems. What you are about to see is a dramatization, a composite of similar encounters. Thing on? Yeah. Okay, now look, the first thing we do when we get to the campsite is crack open the cooler. Right? Right on. Two men are heading off for a weekend camping trip. They're also headed for a shock. In many cases, there's been sightings where a UFO would come out of the sky or hover over a car or come down behind a tree line or something like that. First thing I'd do is I'd quit my job. Sometimes even turning off a car engine, making the lights flicker. But how they actually can do that is really kind of a question mark. I can't believe we ran out of gas. We didn't run out of gas. Something else must be wrong. There are certain characteristics that are reported again and again, regardless of the shape of the craft. One would have to do with silence. It could be a very, very large craft hovering nearby overhead, and the witness reports that it makes absolutely no sound. Oh, we'll just cut through here to get back to the highway. Look, if you didn't think it was such a good idea, you should have said something at the time. There's something wrong with the camera. What is that? What the heck is that? Bob, Bob, what is that? Like what you've just seen, our alien ship can hover silently. Also, the energy produced from its propulsion system interferes with electronics. The ship uses either an anti-gravity drive or a force field generator for its propulsion system. Our engineers are trying to determine which one of these devices the ship uses. 
Perhaps the aliens have discovered a way of silently turning off gravity. Somewhere on this ship might be an anti-gravity drive that negates the natural pull objects like the Earth have on other objects. But what is gravity? For this, we'll need to go to the blackboard. There are four known forces, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak nuclear forces, and gravity. Gravity is the most enigmatic. Ironically, it's the one we're most familiar with and the weakest of the four. If you say you don't really understand gravity very well, you're in good company, because I think not even the best physicists really understand gravity yet. E is equal mc square, in which energy is put equal to mass, multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, Sure. Albert Einstein, while a young patent clerk, revolutionized our understanding of how the universe works with his special and general theories of relativity. In general relativity, Einstein said gravity is the result of the curvature of space caused by energy and mass. Gravity is our experience of that curvature produced by the mass of the Earth. Could this device be an anti-gravity drive? We humans are striving to create our own anti-gravity drives. So far, none has succeeded. And most physicists will tell you it's impossible. Right now, I'd have to say we just don't know. So far, gravity is something that acts on us, and we don't act on gravity. Just because we aren't manipulating gravity yet doesn't mean the aliens aren't. But an anti-gravity drive isn't the only way for the aliens to skirt gravity. A force field generator could allow the saucer to overpower gravity. If it doesn't manipulate gravity, maybe it uses one of the other four known forces for propulsion and levitation. Perhaps the exotic force that holds photos to your fridge. At every point in space surrounding a magnet, there is a force field called the magnetic field. All permanent magnets have a north and south pole. Opposite poles are attractive to each other, and their force fields pull them together. Identical poles repel. And this force will, within certain parameters, overcome gravity. Electrons moving through a coil of wire also produce a magnetic field. So if you want to make a very powerful magnet, you do what many of us have done in second grade, which is you make a coil of wire, and then you put electrical current through it, and you prove that it's an electromagnet by having it attract a nail or some other steel object to it. We're using electromagnets for propulsion right now. A maglev train uses opposing electromagnets to levitate the train and propel it down the track. While the maglev train relies on two sets of magnets to perform its trick, some materials need only one magnetic field to perform the same stunt. This is a hockey puck, if you will, of yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, this is one of the high temperature superconductors that was uh, discovered about 20 years ago. Uh, if we put it in liquid nitrogen to cool it down, then it uh, becomes superconducting and its properties change dramatically. When this gets cold enough, it becomes a superconductor and it then will levitate above this track that's made up of neodymium iron boron magnets. The supercooled superconductor is perfectly diamagnetic. It expels the magnetic field. It's being pushed up against gravity as it's trying to expel the magnetic field out of itself. Another way that you can use magnetic fields to counteract the forces of gravity is through levitating anything that contains water, for example, because water is diamagnetic and it wants to repel magnetic fields. So it really wants to get out of the magnetic field. 
Even living things can be diamagnetic, such as a frog. If you put something that has water in it, and of course our bodies are mostly water, a frog's body is mostly water, uh, you can put that in a magnetic field gradient. So it's a strong field here, it's a weaker field there, it's the weakest field up here. And that water-containing object is going to want to drift up to the weaker magnetic fields. So by configuring your experiment right, you can get that frog to levitate. You, in principle, can get a human being to levitate uh, because we contain so much water. Could this be the way they get the saucer to levitate? Is the saucer made of some super diamagnetic material? In principle, magnetic fields could be used to propel a ship through the air. And it's natural enough that when we look at the story of unidentified flying objects to think about magnetic fields. The levitation experiment with the frog works because there's a big magnet that's positioned right beneath the frog. And that's how we can make the magnetic force be equal to and opposite the gravitational force. Uh, if UFOs were using magnetic levitation, we would not only notice the UFO, we would notice the big magnet that they're lugging around underneath the flying saucer. So I don't, I don't think that would be what they would be using. The alien ship doesn't hover above a big magnet. However, the Earth itself generates a magnetic field. That's why compass needles point north. Maybe the alien ship uses the natural magnetic field of Earth for propulsion within our atmosphere. But the Earth's magnetic field is very weak. We're a few Nobel Prizes away from levitating a ship using a force field generator. But remember, either an electromagnetic repulsive force field generator or an anti-gravity drive could meet the challenges of gravity the aliens face. And the anti-gravity drive is what this alien ship has under the hood after all. The alien anti-gravity drive manipulates Earth's gravity, reversing it against itself and focusing it to prop up our ship on a gravity wave. It can go in any direction it wants. Now that we've learned that this ship can match the acrobatic maneuvers of the most amazing UFO reports, we'll turn our attention to the drives that allow it to travel across the universe. Our alien spaceship uses an exotic form of space travel to cross the galaxies. Because conventional rocket-powered space travel just won't cut it. Space is just too big. Way too big. Take a look at our solar system. If our solar system were about, let's say, a foot long, here's the Sun and here's the orbit of Pluto, and you were to ask, well, where are the nearby stars? The nearby stars would be miles away. After our sun, the closest star is in the Alpha Centauri system, more than four light years away. That means that even if the alien ship could travel at light speed, a mind-boggling 186,000 miles per second, it would still take over four years to get to Alpha Centauri from here. And even if we went, there probably isn't anyone to meet. Scientists optimistically estimate the nearest habitable planet at 45 light years away. Clearly, they're using unconventional methods. Besides, covering such vast distances would require a lot of rocket fuel. All that fuel adds weight, of course. Consider how long it would take the aliens if they were using conventional rockets. Our Voyager missions that explore Jupiter and Saturn are the fastest man-made objects traveling 10 miles per second. Pretty fast, but that's still not fast enough. If the ancient Greeks at the time of Homer had launched a space mission to the nearest stars and it traveled as fast as Voyager, the fastest space probe that humans have ever launched, and if they launched it 5,000 years ago, it would still be 
another 70,000 years before it would get to the nearest star. It wouldn't even be 1% of the way there. This ship is engineered to travel at the speed of light, or even faster. And that's not possible using conventional methods. To do that, the aliens would have to break some laws of physics. Because Albert Einstein won't allow them to go that fast the old-fashioned way. In the early 20th century, Albert Einstein offered a radical new way to understand the universe with his special and general theories of relativity. Einstein theorized that time is relative throughout space. It's gooey and flexible. One of the strange side effects of traveling close to the speed of light is something known as time dilation. According to Einstein, the closer you get to the speed of light, the more the clocks on your ship slow down. So time to you passes more slowly. So if you have somebody approaching the speed of light, say 80 or 90% of the speed of light, time for them is passing very, very slowly. If a rocket blasted off from Earth on a round-trip mission to Alpha Centauri, traveling close to the speed of light, years would have elapsed here on Earth before the mission returned. But on the spaceship, only a few weeks would have elapsed. The crew would have aged only a few weeks, and the in-flight recorder would have indicated a short journey. It's not science fiction, it's really true. We can test this in undergraduate physics laboratories around the world every single day and it works. It's really true that clocks do slow down relative to an observer watching someone as they travel near the speed of light. Now this is in principle, of course, great, but it's also a problem if some spacecraft does a return voyage and it takes five years for it to do and 50,000 years later it arrives back at its home base. But Einstein predicts an even bigger problem. Our ship can only go so fast before it runs into Einstein, the ultimate galactic traffic cop. Einstein says there is a universal speed limit. It's not possible to travel faster than the speed of light because at that speed, the laws of physics fundamentally alter mass. As objects speed up to get closer and closer to the speed of light, they get more massive. If I take a single atom and I want to accelerate it to half the speed of light using conventional rocket fuel, the amount of fuel required will be greater than the mass of the entire visible universe. Our spacecraft, being made of atoms, would have the same problem. The closer the alien ship gets to the speed of light, the more massive it becomes, until ultimately, according to Einstein, it becomes infinitely massive. This is part of the mind-boggling relationship between energy and mass that Einstein grasped a century ago and the rest of the world has been grappling with ever since. It would seem that this is all a roadblock stopping our aliens from traveling the galaxies. But it's really not, because our aliens have found a loophole in Einstein's general theory of relativity. Well, actually, it's not so much a loophole as it is a wormhole. There may be a detour around the speed of light. Our team is busy analyzing the exterior of our alien ship, even as we struggle with how the gears and inner workings function. But our technicians have made a major discovery. They've tapped into what we would call the ship's computer guidance system. It appears there's a map of the universe. This could be a real breakthrough. Contrary to what we all learned in sixth grade, the shortest distance between two points isn't necessarily a straight line. To begin to understand what the aliens are doing, we have to again consult with Einstein about his theories on gravity. Einstein saw mass and space, matter and space, as connected in the sense that 
You could explain gravity by saying that mass distorts space, that it exerts some force on it. Space is curved in the vicinity of matter and that the planets follow the shortest path on the curved surface of space. So massive objects bend space itself. Proof of this bizarre theory, which secured Einstein's place among the gods of physics, came from two British astronomers on expedition during a solar eclipse in 1919. The scientists took photographs of the sun during the eclipse. Within the darkness as the moon shields the sun, stars near the sun are visible. But Einstein believed that some stars behind the sun would also be visible. He predicted their light would be curved by the sun's immense gravity around the sun, and therefore would be visible to us beyond its edge. He actually calculated by what amount it would curve, and in 1919, British astronomers went to see a solar eclipse and verified precisely that his prediction was correct, and Einstein became a household name overnight. Since gravity bends space, maybe aliens utilize that phenomenon to jet across the galaxy. This device appears to be a warp drive. If you could manipulate space, you could expand space behind you and contract it in front of you, and you could build what you might call a warp drive, if you wish, which in some sense is warping space by manipulating it in front and behind you, and in so doing, travel from one place to another, apparently faster than the speed of light. By constricting space-time in front of the craft while expanding space-time behind, the alien ship could propel along like a bullet exiting a rifle. And even better, the clocks inside would run at the same rate as the clocks outside. This is probably one of the most surprising and puzzling things, but it would live in a pocket of ordinary space which wouldn't feel the relativistic effects of its huge velocity. Because our engineers successfully hacked into the alien computer system, we are learning a lot more about the function of the ship. Next to the warp drive is an even more sophisticated device. It too allows for faster than light travel, relatively speaking. A wormhole generator, capable of folding space itself. Think of Alice's looking glass. The looking glass was in some sense a shortcut, a subway system, a tunnel to the fabric of space and time. That is a wormhole. Let's imagine a map of the Earth. Mark A represents New York City. Mark B represents Paris. If we fold the map, they're actually not very far away. Now all we need to do is punch a hole through the map to connect both cities. Voila, the opening is like a wormhole. In 1935, Einstein came out with the first paper on wormholes. We call them Einstein-Rosen bridges. We don't really call them wormholes. But these Einstein-Rosen bridges really do take you from one stage to another, a gateway. Einstein's theory allowed for the possibility of wormholes. Quantum physics suggests that they may occur spontaneously. Einstein's equations we now know are littered with wormholes. It's impossible to look at Einstein's equations without finding a wormhole here or there. They're everywhere. The problem is, how stable are they? Luckily, the wormhole generator also has a stabilizer. That means the aliens can prop open a wormhole and keep it open until the ship passes through. Problem solved. Understanding this alien ship has been a real challenge. We've had to push our knowledge of physics and quantum mechanics to its limit in order to comprehend what our alien visitors have achieved. But we've been able to figure out quite a bit, like how it defies gravity and inertia, and how it can sidestep the speed of light across the universe. The next challenge is turning this insight into our own real machines that can travel through space and time. To meet the aliens on their turf, not as students or subjects, but as equals.